among 18 to 24 year olds, what's the main source of news? TikTok. It's not, it's not yeah, the Wall Street Journal. It's um, the New York Times. Not the, it's not the Bulwark. It's not, it is TikTok. TikTok. It's October 27, 2023. I'm Charlie Sykes. Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast, welcoming back one of our longtime friends and guests, Josh Kroshauer, who uh, has a new job, editor-in-chief of The Jewish Insider, also the author of Axios' Sunday Sneak Peek, which I always read every Sunday. So, Josh, welcome back on the podcast. Charlie, it's great to be back with you. Okay, so I have, to, I have to give people a trigger warning. This is going to be one of the most disturbing podcasts that we have done in a very, very long time because uh, I want to lean directly into, I think, the, the moral depravity of the pro-Hamas left, which my caveat, um, I am not confusing sympathy for Palestinians with being pro-Hamas. Those are two distinct things. I'm also not suggesting that all leftists and all progressives are embracing the kinds of things that we are are, are talking about, but but as I've learned, um, there's a that caveat doesn't work with a lot of people because there there is kind of a culture out there, um, the 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 sense that you're engaging in both sidesism or whataboutism if you criticize anybody on the left. But this is a huge problem. And Josh, look, you and I have been doing this long enough. I am haunted by I think the worst mistake that people on the right made which was to not confront the crackpots of the extremists, uh, the people who were out on the fever swamp, because we never imagined that people like Marjorie Taylor Greene or Lauren, Lauren Boebert or Matt Gates would be significant, that the you know bizarre YouTube uh, freaks like Alex Jones and Steve Bannon, and yes, I am lumping them in, you know, would, would in fact ever rise to a position of real influence. And then you wake up one day, and you realize that the Republican Party is not Mitt Romney. It's not Liz Cheney. You know, it is Donald Trump. It is these freaks that we all told ourselves were kind of the crazy uncle in the corner. And, and I guess I'm sensing on the left, and I can just feel the, the comment section exploding here, this sort of the sense that, okay, so there are some really extreme folks out there who are rationalizing Hamas, who are anti-Israel. But, but you know what? Um, they don't represent most Democrats. They, they're, they represent a very, very small minority. And it's true, Joe Biden has been solid on Israel. The vast majority of elected Democrats have been very solid on this issue. But I want to bounce this off you. How significant and, and how should we react to the fact that there is a large segment not just on college campuses, but you know, obviously focus there, of people who have decided that in three weeks after the atrocities of October 7th, that they are going to rationalize what Hamas did, minimize it. Josh. So to that, to that question, Charlie, I mean, first of all, it's, it's shocking that I feel like we can't hit more rock bottom that you always see a new development in either part, either extreme of yeah. either party that makes you just your jaw drop. How, how is this degree of depravity, this degree of extremism celebrating, uh, the, the, the worst massacre of Jews in any given time since the Holocaust, a pogrom, and you have days later, college campuses erupting in celebration. And this isn't just a few fringe people. If, you know, when, when, when you had in 2019, the awful spectacle at UVA of neo-Nazis marching yeah. on UVA's campus saying, Jews will not replace us. That was bad enough, but that was, and, and Trump's reaction to that was, was bad enough, but that was one campus in one moment with a bunch of fringe figures. What we right. saw, Charlie, this week, it, really the last couple of weeks is on dozens, if not hundreds of college campuses across the country, uh, student groups on the left, on the far left, uh, marching and celebrating the, the massacre of Jews and putting out exterminationist slogans and, and cheering and, and, um, What's I an exterminationist slogan? Let's let let's be precise here. So, I mean, free Palestine from the river is, to the, yeah, yeah. I mean, from, from the from river to the sea. Okay, that that is yeah, wiping out the the Jewish state completely. And I never thought I would see. I mean, the, yes, there's always crazies, there are extremes. Yeah. We've talked about campus culture, Charlie, on the show quite some time. But the degree to which both you would have the number of of of, of students 
um, celebrating and ripping down posters of hostages being held in Gaza by Hamas and, and these, these same protesters ripping them and tearing them apart and doing all, ha- saying all kinds of, 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 of insane things. I never thought I would, that would be like a hundred UVAs, right? In, 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 in one day. Well, um, okay. Like, and, 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 and again, we're not saying that you have to support everything that the government of Israel is doing or not be critical of Israel. Um, but, but what is happening now is, is of a different, I, I think is, is it, is at a different level, you know, for example, you know, when, when you have students at George Washington university, you know, uh, project onto the side of the library, glory to our martyrs and fr- free Palestine from the river to the sea. These are Hamas slogans, but this is what really gets me, Josh, the, the, the one thing I want, I want to focus on, on, on one thing we have, have had hundreds of Jewish civilians, Israeli civilians who were kidnapped or held hostage by the by, by by Hamas, including children, little kids who've been taken away from their parents. And there has been this campaign around the world to call attention to the fate of the children. And so what they have done is they have put up posters. And and, and, and again, these are not political posters. And I want to just, just go to this. Um, this is an information campaign called Let the World Know. And there's no Israeli flag on the posters. There's no mention of politics. They're just they're kind of like, you know, missing children, the kind of things that used to appear on milk cartons. And, and I want to read this article from the Free Press. And still, people all over the world especially young, cool-looking people with nose rings and neon backpacks, are ripping them down. Across the Internet, videos have emerged of people angrily tearing down those posters wherever they find them, in New York City, in Los Angeles, in San Diego, in Santa Cruz, in Richmond, in Miami, in Philadelphia, in Ontario, in Paris, in London. They're ripping the faces of real people who are missing, babies, children, teenagers, women, elderly. They're ripping them to shreds. I have a real hard time getting my head around that. What would motivate someone to think that this is the way I'm going to express my political views. I'm going to go and I'm going to tear down these missing person signs. Just talk to me about this a bit, Josh, because to me, this is, this is really embodies the moral depravity of, of the moment. This is Charlie, the equivalent of Holocaust denial, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, these are some of the people who, when they've been interviewed or asked what, why are they tearing down? uh the, the the posters of hostages yeah they said no no hamas didn't 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 kill 1400 jews they didn't butcher 1400 yeah. jews they they're in their own the, we talk about information bubbles i mean the the, the degree of uh you know epist- ep- epistemological closure they, they can't accept right. reality yeah. um and you're seeing this in, not, not just among a couple of random people but this is widespread among a lot of folks on college campuses and look this is the bit like we talk a lot about sort of um you know, the right wing and you know, QAnon and some of the extreme factions on, on the far right, that's been a running theme in our politics for quite some time. We're now seeing sort of an emerging degree of extremism on, on the far left. Okay. And it's a pit, Charlie, this is really important. It's, it's, it's not among most of the Democratic Party, but it's right. concentrated among 18 to, you know, 25, 18 to 29 year olds. There, right. there was a poll, Mark Penn, uh, Clinton's former pollster, did a poll that got a lot of attention. It's consistent with other pu- public surveys that have been done in recent weeks. That, you know, 95% of people over the age of 60, right. 80% of people over the age of 35, uh, they view Israel very favorably. They condemn Hamas. This is not a, a Hamas is as popular as Vladimir Putin among most yeah, Democrats. Right. But among 18 to 24 news. year olds, yeah. college campus, kids are just, you know, on college campuses, it's 50 50. It's basically 50 50. Mm-hmm. There's just this dramatic change at the very youngest end of the progressive and, 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 and left-wing spectrum and the youngest one. And that is a, that I think we, we kind of shared anecdotes. We're like, yeah, well, these, these kids are crazy. Like some of the mm-hmm. stuff, some of the things going on on college There's campuses. There's real data the showing. Yeah. But now we have hard data. It's not just that one poll. There are other polls that back that up, that this one fringe, this one, you know, faction, young, young, the youngest uh, left-wing voters uh, have a better view of Hamas than they do of the, the Jewish state. And that is something that has been a real wake up. You've seen Democrat, Jewish Democrats, especially uh, liberals. These are not, yeah. these are not, these are not like conservatives are liberal, progressive Jewish Democrats. We're wondering what the heck has happened to, to the movement. What, 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 what is been going on on our college campuses 
And we've seen so many examples, Charlie, of this like at the at the leadership level, where you it's not just the students, Charlie, but you have university presidents, university administrators that don't have uh, a negative thing to say about Hamas. They can't muster the strength to to speak with moral clarity about what happened in Israel on October seventh. Um, and that's been a real wake up call. Not really among, I think a lot of folks on the, on the center and on the right knew this was going on and maybe they didn't degree, uh, didn't, they didn't realize mm-hmm. the scope of it, but it's been a real wake up call to progressives the, that are, right. that are Israel that have seen just the rot that has been taking place at these left wing institutions. Well, I'm, I'm going to dive into this a little bit deeper, but I mean, obviously the, the political implications uh, ought to be obvious and they are immediate. I know that you've, uh, you've uh, tweeted about this mm-hmm. or whatever tweet is called uh, the, these days. There's a new poll showing um, a really dramatic drop in support for Joe Biden among Democrats, I think 11 point drop. And uh, uh, we, we don't have all of the, the cross tabs, but is 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 your suspicion that 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 also that may reflect his strong position on Israel, that it is young people who disapprove of of his full throated uh, support of Israel and his condemnation of Hamas terrorism? Yeah, I mean, that's a Gallup poll that that does show a, a notable drop off in the last couple of weeks among favorability of Biden among Democrats. So it was in the 80s, which is a good, good position for anyone to be in. And it went down to the 70s in, in this last week. Now, look, I, I would love to see a test of Biden. They didn't test Biden versus Trump. And I think mm-hmm. when you think about the broader politics, Charlie, it would have been a Biden has shown stalwart support for Israel. Yeah, right. I mean, I think that that's in the long haul, probably going to help him a lot more than showing weakness and equivocation when it comes to terrorism. I mean, yes, Biden's caught between a rock and a hard place because he has this hard left base of young far left voters that are threatening to stay home or voting for Cornell West Mm or even voting for Trump in some instances. I don't see that happening, but it's a threat that they're making right now. But, but I I do think that if, if Biden didn't do, if didn't speak out, if he didn't show stalwart support for Israel, he would lose support among a lot of pro-Israel Democrats. So oh, that number would, would also go yeah. down. And he'd also lose support among moderates and, and, and swing voters because overall support for Israel is as rock solid as it's ever been yeah. right, in the aftermath of October 7th. So, so it was, there's a, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the on. challenge for Biden is to kind of, um, you know, he's dealing with, uh, you know, a, a, a divided party, but it's important to, to note that it's a fringe of, of the party. It's, it's like it's like when Republicans have to satisfy uh, the MAGA wing, though, though I will say that this is a smaller wing of the Democrats right. right now, the Democratic Party. So. And, 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 so, and, and so far, Joe Biden has not allowed that fringe to hold the Democratic pa- Party hostage in the way that the right wing fringe has been holding the Republican Party hostage. So that that right now is a, is a very, very important distinct, uh, important distinction, well, isn't it? Correct. And you've had yeah. some of the most outspoken defenders of Israel, some of them, the, the right. clarion calls of moral moral leadership, Richie Torres. Democrat from New York, right. uh, Jackie Rosen, up, up yeah. for re-election, Democrat. Who, who've been awesome. the, the, some of the most outspoken defenders of Israel are Democrats, and, and they're the ones, uh, including President Biden and, and a lot of the, 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 the leadership in the administration, have been stalwart and, and shown yeah. strong solidarity with Israel. But they're getting pressure. I, I, they're getting yeah, pressure from, from that far left. Yeah, no, no. R- Richie Torres is a is, is a very young Democratic congressman from the Bronx, um, quite quite progressive, um, and has been as outspoken in criticizing, say, you know, the DSA, the Democratic Socialists of America, as anyone that I've seen out there. I mean, really calling them out for their their extremism. Now, look, critics are going to say when we talk about the people tearing down the posters and these various other things, they're going to say that we're not picking, that we are taking a few random extremists and we are elevating them that we're doing what somebody said this is the foxification of the bulwark that we're even talking about this but the fact is that you know there are there is data that there's a real problem i mean you you write you your your publication of jewish insider wrote you know in the two weeks since hamas's massacre jewish students at american universities have expressed frustration and sadness at official university statements viewed as weak in addition to being Fearful of pro-Palestine student groups and faculty, some of whom have outright celebrated Hamas's attacks. And we have had these incidents. We had the incident at Cooper Union where um, Jewish students were chased into the library, you know, where people were pounding on the door. Um, students at NYU uh, chanting, we want it all. We don't want no Jew state. Um, we have um, the, uh, the uh, John Podoritz writing about this today. That uh, that authorities are telling Jews in New York, in New York, 
that maybe they ought to kind of shelter in place, that there are these pro-Palestinian marches and it might not be, be safe. So there is this sense of fear and menace among Jewish students um, that is real. So this is not just, we're not just talking about social media chatter here. So talk to me about that yep. because there was a, and I, I'm trying to remember the last time there was this, this much overt anxiety and evidence of danger to American Jews. Yeah, Charlie, I, I've never seen this degree of open, naked anti-Semitism out in the open to the extent that we've seen in the last few weeks. And, and, and keep in mind, this happened after after the worst atrocity against Jews in, 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 in any time since the Holocaust. And look, I, I'm a fan of data, I, as you know, like I, I don't, anecdotes are fine, but yeah, let's look right, at the numbers, right. let's look at the, right. the data. The Anti-Defamation League tracks anti-Semitic incidents across the country. They keep a pretty thorough database. And they found that between last year, post-October 7th to October 27th, to, to this year, post-October 7th, uh, anti-Semitic incidents jumped 388%. Um, in that same period. So it's a, it's a, it's a year by year comparison. It's a huge, not, not just a spike. It's a, it's surge. a staggering number. Yeah. And you know, we've, we've seen the videos, we've seen the, mar the pro Hamas marches on campuses from Harvard to UVA. So we can see it with our own eyes, but the data, which a the anti-defamation league tracks. Well, pretty let, let me, let, yeah. Let me talk about this because, well. because this, this, this data is important because again, you know, the, 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 the blowback that I get is, well, it's just a few, you know, people here and there, you know, you're, you know, um, blowing it out of proportion. Well, this 388% increase in anti-Semitic incidents has occurred just since October 7th. A, a map of the incident shows clusters in various states in California and San Francisco Bay area. And Los Angeles uh, featured high levels of anti-Israel rallies, some with support for terrorism. Uh, numerous protests also took place around Detroit near the district represented by Representative Rashida Tlaib. I want to talk about her in just a moment. Um, also, you have um, you know, incidents of overt advocacy for Hamas and outright hatred toward Jews in New England, uh, New York, Pennsylvania, and Maryland. This is, again, anti-defamation league. On October 8th in Clifton, New Jersey, a car with individuals holding Palestinian flags um, it appeared to intentionally swerve out of its lane, nearly hitting a visibly Jewish family. Uh, next day, on October 9th, in Detroit, Jewish student was harassed, shoved, called a fucking Zionist, while painting a free speech right with uh, rock with an Israeli flag on the campus of Wayne State University. On October 10th, in Los Angeles, an individual shouted, I am Hamas, and made death threats to Jewish individuals standing by a kosher restaurant. On October 12th, in Indianapolis, a man carrying an Israeli flag was assaulted by a pro-Palestinian protester. And this goes just on and on. On October 15th, in New York, an individual allegedly punched a Jewish woman in the face at Grand Central Terminal when she was asked why he responded, because you are Jewish, on and on and on. Okay, so Josh, just step back from the politics of the moment. Why is this happening? Why is there this huge generation gap? As you pointed out, among older progressives and Democrats, overwhelming support for Israel. When you get to this younger demographic, the hope, the future of the Democratic Party, much, much more uh, divided. What has been going on um, that has caused this kind of a dramatic rift, fall off of support for Israel to the point where we have a sizable, when we have a minority, but a sizable, significant minority, willing to actually rationalize some of the worst atrocities in our lifetimes. Well, we could spend the whole podcast going into yeah. the origins of this, yeah. this anti-Semitism, but I'll bring up two, two big points. Number one, the universities have become, you know, rotten in many ways where you have, you know, the academic, the standards have gone down, uh, the, what, what, what the kind of activism mm -hmm. and, and, and far left uh, prop propaganda being taught to students. Uh, there's been a lot of documentation of this. Some have been more on the, the center, center, right side of, the aisle, but it's been, we, you know, this is a, an ongoing theme that I think a lot of people are like, well, colleges are always like that. And we kind of took it with a grain of salt. And now you see the product of the, these professors. These are not just students, Charlie. You have, you had a professor at Cornell, um, you know, literally, uh, you know, uh, spouting pro Hamas slogans who was suspended uh, for the time being, who was uh, being cheered on by his students. And you see, you know, professors all over the country giving leave to, and excused absences to their students so they can protest Israel and, and, and 
participate in some of the violence. Okay, but is this really new? Let, let's go to this point. People will say, look, okay, you know, colleges have always been considered hotbeds of radicalism. There have always been radical professors. I mean, you go back into the 1950s and you see the same kinds of complaints. Is this just the same old, same old? I mean, isn't this like the 1960s or, or is there something new? Is there something yeah, I, 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 I think, I mean, look, happening there, but there, I think there is something new. I think there was always at least some degree of pluralism in, in yeah. a lot of institutions. There was, uh, you know, the fact that you can't see many, you didn't see many university presidents condemn Hamas in the yeah. aftermath of, I mean, there's something different. That would not have happened 10 years ago, Charlie. Um, and, and the degree ago. of a faculty that are just uh, spouting some of the, there's, there's an ideology, you call it critical race theory, the wokeness, whatever you want to call it. I, I, don't, I don't, I'm not an academic. I don't, yeah. I don't study these things closely, but people have been writing about it, that there's something different. There's something, a sickness going on at the university level where a lot of very extreme ideologies have been propagated. And this is, and being anti-Israel is part and parcel of a lot. It's like buying the bundle. You get the bundle of, of far left uh, slogans and being anti, you, you can't be a true progressive in the eyes of a lot of these academics if you're not anti-Israel. So that's one part of it. The other big part though, I think is important, which is social media. And, and the fact you see, uh, oh, Jonathan Haidt has written about like the changes in our politics after 2013 and 2014, when kids started using smartphones and uh, the rise of extremism within the parties during that period of time, that that tracks pretty closely with where this public opinion shifts. Where you know when it comes to uh, public opinion of Israel and 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 even like tolerating Hamas, um, you, you look at there was a, a good uh, analysis that was written yesterday uh, looking at TikTok and how um, TikTok basically promotes all kinds of like the, the most idiotic anti-Israel propaganda to, to unsuspecting kids mm. that uh, just scroll on their phones. And that, 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 by the way, Charlie, that's how anyone, there's been a lot of data from Pew that show that among 18 to 24 year olds, what's the main source of news? TikTok. It's not, it's not yeah, the Wall Street Journal. It's um, New York Times. Not the one, it's not the Bulwark. It's not, it is TikTok. TikTok. And I don't know we if we doomed. fully, I mean, again, this is, I'm a dinosaur. I'm 40, you know, I'm kind of a dinosaur these days, uh, but it's hard to imagine that like you would actually get your news from a bunch of kids spouting off crazy things on their, on their, you know, the, the selfies of these videos. Um, but that is, you, the data is pretty clear that the youngest Americans, the, the college students don't read newspapers. They don't read uh, any, any news, real traditional news source. They don't even get their news from like a digital news source. They, they get it from TikTok. They get it from okay. these closed social so, media. Let, let, let's stick with this for a moment because, you know, for, for, for some of our, 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 our listeners, why did it become part of the bundle that if you are left wing, you have to be anti-Israel? I mean, that's not completely obvious, right? So traditionally, what 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 has happened here? I mean, I, I think there's been an escalation, but what is the left's objection to Israel? Long standing. Well, there's this there's this dog doctrine that it's like that, that propagates that Israel is a colonialist state and we're we're here to take over you know mm-hmm. cleanse the world of colonialism yeah, and right. I think you know there there are people there's the well, there's been a lot of commentary in recent days about the origin of these ideologies right. the revolutionary nature Charlie of some of these the the, 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 the how how someone could actually defend the the bloodthirsty murder of children and elderly and and and, and civilians yeah like what happened in in, in southern Israel like. It's hard to get your head around it, but yeah, it there is. are ideologies that actually defend, they kind of rationalize these behaviors and they're percolating on, on, on college campuses. But I also think, Charlie, when you ask about the, the bundle, like the, we've seen it on the right. We've seen, you know, uh, how, how is like being against funding for Ukraine have anything to do with woke, anti-wokeness, right? right, what, right. What, do they, what do they have to do with each other? But in, in the social media age, when people uh, are just, you know, not thinking, but they're just emoting, right? That, that 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 is like the incentive to just kind of bundle all these ideas together and, and you're part of this this tribal group and that's we, we saw that a lot on the right in recent years and we're certainly seeing it on the left and dare i say this is almost even more extreme when you rationalize yeah. the butchery of of children and 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 and, and, so and, they're, and they're, 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 they're kind of in the bundle of people who are oppressed so we have to have solidarity among all of the oppressed peoples of the world including the palestinians um, it does seem to be a leap, though, and I think this is what was really shocking to to me and, and to others. It's a leap to say, OK, um, I may sympathize with you politically. Um, you know, Gaza has been kind of a scandal to it for a long time. But then to watch what happened on October 7th and find ways to say, yeah, the Israelis had this coming. 
um, the lack of visceral disgust, human reaction to what was done, because it's hard to imagine more graphic atrocities than what took place here. And so you would think that, that, okay, people may have an ideology, but still have the capacity to be horrified. And I guess this is why I'm drawing this distinction between being sympathetic to, to Palestine, Palestine, the Palestinians, the, uh, um, and just horrified by Hamas. I mean, I, I, I can understand why people would be very disillusioned and very suspicious of the government of Benjamin Netanyahu, who has been very divisive, you know, among among his Israelis. So, you know, nobody's giving him a blank check right now. And yet, how do you read these stories of the rape and the murder of women and old people and children and then decide that the next day you're going to go out and tear down posters with the kids pictures on them? I mean, there, 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 there's something about the callousness and the depravity that seems almost separable from the ideology. These far left activists, Charlie, are they view themselves as revolutionaries. They, 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 we've yeah. seen this throughout world history. You know, the, the Jacobins or the, you know, the, 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 the you know, the London the, during the Russian Revolution. I mean, the, the, yeah. that's that's the model for, for a lot of them. And then, then you've seen and I'm again, I'm no scholar of, of the intellectual history behind some of these ideas, but. That's how they just, they, they, they think that, you know, you know, you need a revolution and you need to have, you know, awful things to happen for a revolution to take place. And it's a very, I mean, look, I think a lot of, Charlie, I also think a lot of these people are ignorant. They're following the mob. I mean, I think yeah, how many yeah, kids actually yeah. know anything about what they're, you know, it, 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 or, or understand what, what they're bigger. chanting or they're, you know, they're going through the high school halls going, you know, from the river to the sea, what percentage of those kids have any idea what that right. means? The, right. There's a lot. I mean, the, the shock is that there's been sort of this alliance of like Islamist groups and, and far left. <laughs> campus activists so what what does an lgbt group have anything to do with you know israel but there are these alliances among certain communities on campus yeah. i don't think anyone knows at all about okay. what they're talking about but they, there's a mob mentality where everyone kind of yeah. sees a video on social media and then all of a sudden they gather and 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 it, it, it's it's a it's a festival of rage and uh well, and well, hate. Look, look, yeah let's go back to where we started the, the need of you know every group to police its own um Give me your take on all of this. It, it seems that for the moment, um, the Biden administration has been very solid. You can disagree with me on this. Um, the vast majority of Democrats pushing back very hard. People like Rashida Tlaib seem very isolated in the party right now. How do you evaluate the pushback? I mean, yes, a lot of university presidents failed the moral test here, but but at least in the political world, I'm not, I am sensing a willingness to push back on it. And you, you, you uh, at the Jewish Insider, you've done some reporting on this. So what's, what's your take? How do you, how do you uh, tally this up? Yeah, look, publicly, President Biden has been pretty, pretty rock solid on yeah. showing his support for Israel. In fact, I, I think, I think a lot of people don't appreciate the differences between the last Democratic president, Barack Obama, who, uh, you know, engaged in some, some degree of normalization and diplomacy hmm. towards Iran and had hmm. a lot of top staffers that very, were much more hostile to Israel than the current administration. And I don't think you would hear like a President Obama say Hamas mm. is ISIS, as President really? Biden has okay. said. Yeah, I think I think there's I mean, and, and the degree of support, the, the the reminder that, you know, Hamas, you know, started this war and, and Israel's mm. defending itself, as John Kirby said at the White House briefing yesterday. I mean, those are those are important things to say. And the White House has been pretty, pretty, pretty strong when it comes to uh, being morally more, more showing a moral clarity that, that you haven't always seen. Um, and on the, on the Democratic Party. Um, so look, I think I think Biden has done a great job in terms of his public messaging. There is a concern in Israel about well, they they call it the bear hug, where you know President Biden goes to Israel, meets with the families of hostages, mm -hmm. shows a, an incredible amount of solidarity. Biden's approval in Israel has, has surged in the last few weeks, but there's also privately some urging that Israel should be more restrained in its uh, ground invasion right. of Gaza, that they should maybe they shouldn't you know take out Hamas as as aggressively as they want to, maybe they shouldn't open up another front and in, in, in try to take out Hezbollah. And then, so there's this concern that privately they're, they're kind of using the capital they built up to sort of caution the Israelis and not to go quite as, quite as tough, uh, Wait, uh, you know, you, you hope they are though, right? I mean, you hope that they are exercising restraint and saying, you know, if in fact you, we go, you go in and there are massive civilian casualties that you will squander um, a lot of goodwill and um, that you will have handed Hamas the kind of propaganda victory that, that perhaps they had hoped for. 
Well, look, and, so, and, and there's the yeah. big debate on the Israeli side too. But there's a war yeah. cabinet in Israel with Ben Netanyahu and and Gallant, his defense minister, and um, uh, one of the opposition leaders who's now a part of this this war cabinet. They they're, they need to figure it out. They're, they're, they're different views on how to prosecute this war. So I I, I think that's just sort of a a, a sidebar to to the, the the public displays of support that this White House has shown Israel. Uh, you know, you mentioned Rashida Tlaib, and I think. Yeah. The one similarity I think you're seeing, and we've reported on this at Jewish Insider, between the early years of Trump, when you ask Democrat or when you ask Republican lawmakers, what do you think of this Trump tweet? What do you think of this crazy thing mm -hmm. Trump said? And they claim not yeah, to hear it, or they it. they would say like, I don't believe that, but I, I don't I don't know, you know, I'm not going to condemn Donald Trump. We're, we heard aside from a few Jewish Democrats that have been very very strongly pro Israel, like Richie Torres, Jared Moskowitz from Florida, a couple others. But the vast majority of House Democrats claim not to. Uh, Hakeem Jeffries really? said he didn't know about Rashida Tlaib's tweet about um, basically, you know, accusing falsely accusing Israel of of bombing that 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 hospital in, in Gaza and keeping it up even after it's been okay. Um We had we talked to at least uh, I think about a half dozen additional House Democrats who condemned what Tlaib had to say, but would not criticize Tlaib herself. Um, okay, so, so there's going to be a dynamic. Yeah, yeah. Where it's like I don't I don't know the tweet I haven't seen the tweet I haven't seen seen what they're saying or I I don't agree with what they're saying but I'm not going to criticize the extremists themselves. So okay, so this is this is actually a pretty good segue to uh, our discussion of what's going on with uh, with with Congress right now. Uh, one of the first things that's going to happen under the new speaker, uh, the fifth string speaker, uh, Mike Johnson, will be censures and votes on expulsion. They're going to have a, an expulsion vote apparently. Um, on George Santos, they're also going to have a censure vote on on Rashida Tlaib. What is your sense? Um, I'm I'm guessing that that will pass because the Republicans have the vote. How will Democrats vote on that? The censure of Rashida Tlaib. Well, I don't think it was a smart first move to have Marjorie Taylor Greene be the person who uh, <laughs> yeah, but... wrote, wrote the wrote the legislation. I mean, that's nobody's just... accused them of being political geniuses here, so. I mean, you're you're literally looking at the two extremes. I mean, that that's mm -hmm. where politics are these days, Charlie. That that's right. Um, you know, Tlaib versus uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene. Look, the, the resolution I think is generally sensible, but there is there's some language about an insurrection. There were a bunch of pro Hamas, mm -hmm. you know, people that gathered in a House office building. It wasn't January 6th, though. It wasn't. There were a lot of awful slogans, but it wasn't a, an insurrection. Mm -hmm. And that's in that that's the language of that resolution. So essentially, Marjorie Taylor Greene is giving. Democrats and out to say, you know, we, you know, to, to vote against this resolution, even though I think you would get if it was a more sensibly worded resolution calling for Rashida Tlaib censure, I think you would get uh, bipartisan support. But again, no, everyone misses an opportunity to miss an opportunity. That's the state of our politics these days. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, well. So, yeah, I, I, I don't think that's going to get much Democratic support just because there's some poison language that was written in that resolution. Okay, so let let's let's talk about uh, the other big story of the week. Uh, after after three weeks without a speaker, we finally have a, a speaker. Um, I, in in my newsletter this morning, I I'm you know take I, with all due respect, you know the the NPR headline. I think with the NPR headline is something like House Republicans end their infighting and elect a Speaker of the House. And I said, N sorry, no, the infighting is not over. They still hate one another. The dysfunction is a pre-existing condition. So give me your sense of this, this, this ending where you end up with a guy that we all had to Google because nobody had ever heard of Mike Johnson. Guy has a very, shall we say, checkered, colorful record, apparently kind of a nice guy, but Adam Kinzinger describes him as Jim Jordan in drag. Um, how how is Mike Johnson going to do? I mean, how 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 much how much rope is he going to get from the people who have shown a willingness to burn down the house if they don't get their way? Well, look, I, I you're right. I had to go to my almanac of American politics to look at the Mike Johnson bio because he's no he's a bit of you know you know he's not been a prominent member of the House Republican Caucus. Yeah, he's a very mildly. socially conservative Republican yeah. to dating back to before he got got into yeah. Congress. Uh, so like if there's any, if he has strong ties to the Christian conservative community yeah. uh, in his district and, and, and across the country. Um, look, I think he's very, even Liz Cheney uh, in, in her book uh, or uh, in John Carl's book actually mm -hmm. said he was a close friend of hers uh, when they first were freshmen in Congress. But when he denied the results and sponsored, you know, efforts to overturn the election, that that was a breaking point for Liz Cheney. Um he he also you know look he's he on everything else he's pretty pretty much 
in the same space as uh, Jim Jordan. But I yeah. will say that like a lot of people do change. I mean, there is an evolution when you're in leadership. It's easy to throw bombs when you're in the the back bench or you're you're not in leadership. And it's going to be an interesting test to see if there's any evolution that takes place because that was the problem. I mean, look, the best case scenario for for Republicans is that he has credibility with the right. And they can they they maybe they they listen to him more than they did with Kevin McCarthy. And if that's the case, then maybe yeah, I mean, it's the Nixon goes to China dynamic. Maybe maybe in a, okay, in so, a that case scenario, he can keep the right in line and 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 actually forge a more more pragmatic path. But I think as you laid out, Charlie, that's not going to be easy. The Republican Party is divided uh, between the MAGA, but the, the, I think the majority is it's fair to say is now in the MAGA camp. But oh, you I still do have fair to say the full yeah. share of rank and file Republicans and that look at it. Then you have the eight Republicans who, you know, defenestrated Kevin McCarthy and, and are nihilists, uh, to, 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 that really just destroyed the, the institution for three weeks. So it's not going to be easy for Mike Johnson. And, uh, I, I, I guess the only thing you can say politically is I don't think anyone really knows who he is and it may take some effort for Democrats to brand it, uh, negatively, even though he does have a pretty, pretty, uh, well, I, th- I, 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 I think, I think, if, you know, I mean, if they, unless they're really, really bad, they will be able to brand him. But, you know, you, you look, look back on what happened and, you know, the day before he was elected, uh, I, I think it was very much in doubt whether any Republican could get 217 votes. Steve Scalise couldn't, Tom Emmer couldn't, uh, Jim Jordan couldn't, uh, Kevin McCarthy couldn't. And so, it was kind of remarkable that he got unanimous support. So a couple of things happened. You you had, you know, this, as I described it, the squishes, you know, did what squishes do. They, you know, one after another, uh, they caved in. Um, it just felt like that one of the underrated factors here was just simple exhaustion. They just were sick of it. He was the next man up. And all the people who like might have appeared to be taking principled stands or might have cared about some issue, the Ken Bucks of the world, the Michael Lawlers. It was like, okay, we're just done with this. Was that, I mean, it, it, it felt like an exhaust, yeah, like it was an, an exhausted caucus. It was just done with it. Look, Charlie, it was embarrassing. I mean, the, the, the Republican yeah, right. party looked like the most dysfunctional governing body in, on the planet after yeah, the, and they the, knew they looked stupid. Yeah. I mean, they, they defenestrated their, their leader. They couldn't find anyone else. Uh, Jordan, uh, Scalise, Emmer, no one was acceptable. These ugly personal feuds, by the way, which continued to this day, which are now continue. oddly open. Um, and look, th- there's a bigger, I-, I think it's fair to say there's a bigger or as much, at least as much of a divide between the MAGA wing of the Republican Party in the Congress and like the McConnell wing, right, in the Senate, which yeah. uh, which has a lot, lot of different views on major policy issues um, as there is between like McConnell and Democrats, right? And on right. foreign policy, McConnell was actually echoing Joe Biden and, and supporting the um, know. the kind foreign aid package uh, for Ukraine and for Israel. Uh, and and, and I, that, I, we'll see what happens in the House, but I know a majority of the Republicans in that body are dead set against uh, anything for Ukraine. So it, it is fascinating to what we're, we, we, we talk about co- like different countries have coalition governments, right? They have, you have to build a, Republicans essentially have a coalition a party, right? They have two sides of the party that are increasingly at odds with each other on fundamental issues of what it means to to be a, a conservative. And I think that the, the loyalty to Trump kind of papers over some of those really serious ideological divisions that are that are only growing. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I and this is what's so interesting about what Mike Johnson's going to do. It, it looks like um, the, you know, the the, the Gates caucus is going to give him a little bit of flexibility on not shutting down the government, uh, going ahead with a CR. So, you know, for the next couple of weeks, but this is not a honeymoon. This is a reprieve because again, as you mentioned, the math hasn't changed. The divisions haven't changed. This is still Donald Trump's party. So I, I guess, uh, the, the immediate question was, will they shut down the government? Probably not. But what happens with Ukraine and Israel? Because that seems to be the one real breaking uh, point, not just between Democrats and Republicans, but as you point out, between the Senate Republicans and now the magified House majority, what do you think is going to happen? How will this get resolved? Uh, Joe Biden and, and Mitch McConnell want to link Israel and Ukraine. Republicans in the House aren't going to go along with it. What happens? So I think you're right about on the government funding. I think there, there will be something of a reprieve. The Republicans don't want to go through the chaos right. of the last three weeks all over again. Uh, yeah. You know, you consider interesting. Mike Johnson was one of the Republicans who voted against Ukraine aid. Um, yeah. in the House beforehand, but he did give comments since being elected speaker, sh- signaling a, maybe a little bit of a degree to compromise or have have a larger discussion. Mm-hmm. 
So the, the, the mood in the caucus is to fund Israel, not, not Ukraine, and to, or at least to separate the two, uh, not, not bundle them together. But I, I do wonder, um, especially, well, I do wonder since, and a lot has happened since M- McCarthy was, was ousted as speaker. Um, and I do wonder if the mood has changed a little bit, um, in terms of trying to uh, help Ukraine. A lot, a lot of Republicans in the Senate are linking the fight for freedom and the fight against totalitarianism and tyranny. Um, and, and that Biden's doing the same. And it may be a tough sell, but the mood may have shifted a little bit. And maybe Johnson has a little more running room than, than McCarthy would have on that front. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, that's obviously, you know, urgently necessary. And, um, again, we're in this situation where if there was an up or down vote on the floor of the house, I think, uh, Ukraine aid would pass overwhelmingly with a bipartisan majority. The question is whether or not he can allow that vote to take place, uh, given all this. Okay. This, this feels like a, a footnote and maybe even an irrelevant footnote, but it is interesting, um, in the far reaches of MAGA. And I've, I've gotten used to now looking at things that, again, you might have ignored before, kind of the the cloud on the horizon, you know, because we've seen how fast that cloud on the horizon, you know, comes here. The uh, the number of sort of right wing media influencers who are going after um, Johnson because of and they're holding against him comments that he made back in 2020 that were sympathetic to George Floyd, you know, the black man who was murdered in, in Minneapolis. And at the time, he had uh, some sympathy for him. He said, yes, it was murdered. And he, and he talked about, you know, the, the the problem of being black in America. And it's, it's a very different Mike Johnson than we've seen uh, more recently. What you have folks on the right who are now saying, you know, he can't really be MAGA if he, in fact, believed that black lives actually mattered and showed uh, sympathy and concern about racism. And so uh, I don't know whether this is going anywhere, but um, any any time these things percolate, you at least have to be aware that um, there are folks in the MAGA world who are already, you know, planning to, you know, cut, cut, cut him off at the knees. Well, look, the lesson from this whole conversation is that crazy ideas that bubble up online can suddenly right. become mainstream overnight. Exactly. So that is the, exactly. We've, we've seen that, that lesson is. and, 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 and we're seeing it all over and the, 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 that, that, you know, we may joke about it or think it's marginal, but that those are the types of ideas that can really, uh, metastasize. Well, and, and yeah, and, and this is, and one of the reasons, again, to, to, to repeat what we said before is you know, this is the real danger of the tribalization is that when you buy in, you have to buy the bundle and you have to buy all the allies. And some of those allies are going to take you into places you do not want to go. And trust me, um, I have lived this experience. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's with, it's with a great deal of, of of history that I am urging people on the left, like do not downplay what is happening right now because uh, the future comes at you really hard and fast in ways that you did not necessarily expect. Josh Crashauer, thank you so much for joining us again. Uh, we're going to look forward to uh, your your Sunday newsletter from uh, from Axios. It comes out every Sunday. When 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 should we get it in every- our mailbox? Every Sunday afternoon, uh, just sign up at axios.com to, to sneak peek and, and you can sign up at Jewish Insider, jewishinsider.com and get our daily kickoff newsletter every weekday, Monday through Friday. Uh, which, which, which I do. Josh is, of course, is the editor in chief of, of uh, Jewish Insider. And thank you all for listening to this weekend's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We will be back on Monday. We'll do this all over again. <laughs>